Hey, everyone. So Chief Scientific Officer of Google, Ray Kurzweil, says that by 2040, we will be one billion times more intelligent than where we are today. Why? Because our brain will singularity be connected to the Internet through AI. Wow. What does this mean for the psychedelic industry? Find out now in our latest podcast. Hey, everyone, welcome to the Dales Report podcast and very, very happy to be joined here today with award winning filmmaker, entrepreneur and psychedelic advocate, Zappy Zaplin. How are you? Ah, oh, I'm great. I'm here in Miami and life is good. You down look here. like you are dressed for Miami. How's the weather? Uh, currently raining, but it's beautiful. It's like mid seventies and, uh, everybody's here from New York and California. Right? It's like really the place to be. It's probably the hottest psychedelic area as far as business goes in the, in the entire really? country, which is great. What are you seeing down there yeah. as far as business wise, uh, that makes you think that, uh, a, a lot of companies, uh, a lot of law firms, a lot of people who have exited San Francisco yeah. who would otherwise be there, New York, different places. The medical scene is happening in a big way down here. It's really, I think it's the epicenter of the psychedelic corporate movement. Don't, don't you think it's crazy? Florida's kind of like the new New York, is it not? Or Los Angeles, where everybody, it's like, the way, like Governor DeSantos, I know people love him or hate him, but quite honestly, at the end of the day, if you want to go about your life and you want to do business, uh, it seems that Florida is kind of like what life was prior to COVID. And that's why a lot of people are gravitating towards that. Do you find that? Yeah, I really do. I think it's going to be the new New York because the New Yorkers all figured out they don't have to yeah. be there. Nobody cares if you're on Wall Street or on your computer. And all the access that you have from Europe and South America, it's just, you know, it's just an easy, easy place to pop in and pop out. So there's quite a few psychedelic companies and, you know, that's what's exciting to me. And plus everybody comes through Miami once or twice yeah. a year. So you don't really have to travel if you're here. You just get yeah. back and see who's in town that week. So it's yeah. always great to obviously have somebody you on who's a big advocate for the industry. Um, you're an award-winning filmmaker. So needless to say, you have quite the resume. And we all know people with brilliant minds, obviously the mind never stops. You know, it's always ongoing all the time, which I can sure you can understand and relate to. Um, why the psychedelic industry? Um, cause you've been involved for this for quite some time. Yeah. You know, I personally have had some incredible experiences with psychedelics uh, throughout my life. And when I, you know, really saw back in 2011, when I was making the reality of truth film with Michelle Rodriguez, and we went down to Peru and drank plant medicine and things, that was really the first time that I tried to use it medicinally for my own mental health. And I had such a great situation occur from that, that I started to tell everybody, hey, this is an important thing. If I saw somebody struggling with addiction or depression, this was my first go-to uh, you know, uh, solution. And so as all the evidence has started to come out and all the medical you know, realities have set in that we're in a mental health crisis, suicide, yeah. addiction, depression, the, the, it's it's we're in a time where we need this yeah. right now. And I'm trying to really be maybe the most radical voice in the psychedelic movement to say, Hey, we need legalization. Now we have people who are suffering and we need relief. Psychedelics are the only thing that we've seen that could really disrupt this mental health crisis. So rather than talking about it, like they did with yeah. cannabis or, you know, going through all these different things with state and federal and all that, we're demanding the right to go inside our minds right now. We want the president to sign, a executive order and my nonprofit, which is called the mind mm -hmm. of me fighting for the right to pursue happiness. We're demanding this right right now. And we're telling people just, you know, act as though these things are legal, because if somebody in your family is in a crisis, we're not going to sit here in two, 2022 and have people tell us, okay, alcohol is good. Tobacco is good, but somehow psilocybin mushrooms are bad. And even if somebody in your family or yourself are struggling, they can't access that. When and um, I just want to say, Shad, that maybe in the 60s, that made some sense when they said they had needed to study safety uh, and efficacy. But now here we are, you know, 54 years later, and this is a crisis that we need these plants for. And thankfully, they're here. They're safe. Millions of people have used it. And uh, we have this to break the 
current mental health crisis. I've always been a, th- and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a generational thing where it's a stigma from previous generations and how psychedelics were viewed. And quite honestly, um, a lot of political leaders are still from that era that are in place. So you're right. Are we, are we moving away from, are they, are they opening up to the idea based on some of the conversations that you have? Because the data speaks for itself. Yeah, you know, I'm talking to top people who are doing studies, whether it's United Healthcare, companies like that, um, who are recognizing the opportunity. And I think what we in the psychedelic industry have to accept is that there's not a conspiracy to keep these things down. What it is, is it's a total lack of education. So we have to educate the medical community, the politicians. That's our job right now. And if we do that, uh, the, you know, the, the science speaks. Can for I itself. ask you when you went and took that trip 10 years ago to Peru, where were you mentally prior to that trip? What was going through your mind? Uh, I was having what I call a, a spiritual midlife crisis where I pretty much done everything that society told me to do, to be happy, you know, make money, have a yeah. family, do, you know, all these things. And I did it and I was sitting there going, well, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm happy, but like, I don't understand who I am and I'm not fulfilled and I have to get to the bottom of that. And I had, you know, experiences that were good with psychedelics, but never with the right intent. And I said to myself, why don't you do this with the right intent? Try to go inside your own mind, trust nature and, um, you know, get some answers. And that's what I wound up doing. I brought a film crew because I wanted yeah. to share it with people after the fact, but uh, it was really a personal experience for me to do Did that. Did you battle depression and, and suicidal thoughts and stuff like that? If you don't mind me asking without getting too personal, that's pretty personal, mm-hmm. obviously, question. Sure, sure. I I was not depressed. Um, I would say that like everybody at different points in your life, you go, what's the use? Mm-hmm. You know, I think Alan Watts always said, you know, uh, looking into, you know, should I kill myself? That's probably the most interesting path you can follow and you're going to probably if you go deep enough figure out the answer is no but you know if you don't understand or have a fulfilling life then you know it's hard to get up every day and be excited and i wanted that and so when i had that transformation through psychedelics where i was excited i did turn my brain on i did you know open up more of my consciousness uh you know i came back from there wanting that for absolutely everybody and um started to tell everybody about that. And what happened was I started to, uh, as I talked about plant medicine, people said to me, Zappy, I would love to do it, but my family's not going to let me do it. And I found ketamine and I thought, wow, here's an FDA approved Western medicine. This is the gateway. And I believe that because I want to tell you, Shad, the science on ketamine that's coming out is incredible. They say you have this area of your brain called the default mode network. And there's a mechanism in there called your lateral habenula. It's recording all the stress you've ever had in your whole life. If it becomes too much, your brain goes into this burst mode. And when you're in burst mode, it shuts off all your dopamine production. That's your happiness, your motivation. The first time you do medical ketamine, it takes the brain out of burst mode and you immediately start getting that dopamine back. So I get calls from you know, clients all the time. Yeah. Their, their wife or the husband the next day calls up and it's like, Oh my God, he just cleaned the garage. He was claiming he's doing that for five years, but whatever you're doing, keep it up. And that mechanism, these exciting things to know that every time you do a ketamine treatment, you're building new neural pathways in the brain. I mean, you know, all of us should want to use as much of our brain as possible and try to expand our consciousness. And that's what ketamine represents in a safe and easy and FDA approved formula. That blows my mind away. Like, doesn't it? It, it, it? Yeah, no, it's really, you know, when I think about the fact that microdosing psilocybin mushrooms is probably going to eliminate all the antidepressants out there. And you can see in the science why that would be. Um, ibogaine that I did uh, yeah. myself, but I also took Lamar Odom, the basketball yeah. player down to Mexico to do. Um, that one breaks a heroin addiction in 24 hours. Matt, uh, 24 there's nothing else that can hours. do that. Yeah, one time, uh, 24 hours. So it's like somebody that's on heroin has been taking it, whether it's for six months, six years, whatever, they can be cured of the addiction within 24 hours. 
Yeah, the ibogaine actually goes in and rewires your entire brain. It wipes your prefrontal cortex so you have no cravings anymore. So when you walk out of that ibogaine experience, you're not craving anything. People drop two packs of cigarettes a day, alcohol, uh, gambling, heroin. Yeah. It's just, it's that quick. Is there any, because um, you know, I know when I watch, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say we have to be conscious about how we grow ibogaine in the future because we're going to need a lot of it in this country. Yeah. And we have to educate folks about it. But I think if we do it consciously, this is going to be uh, this is going to address the entire opiate epidemic. Right. It's now. incredible. Where is this industry, you think, in five years from now? Um, I think because of the mental health crisis that we're in and the PTSD coming out of uh, COVID, I think we're going to get, you know, some kind of legalization in the next 12 to 24 months, whether that's decriminalization all the way to legalization. Certainly before the end of the decade, these are going to be legal and a lot of them are going to be, you know, accepted as, uh, you know, so best you th- practices. You think medicine. legalization is going to take place with some compounds within the next 12 to 24 months? I do. Uh, there's already quite a few rescheduling um pushes going on right now. And right now, most of these psychedelics are schedule one, which means they have, according to the uh, FDA, or FDA or the DEA, they have no medical benefit and they're highly addictive. Well, we know that co- compounds like psilocybin and ibogaine and these different things have medical benefit. That's yeah. clear. So they need to be rescheduled at least to schedule two or schedule three, where they can be you know, studied en masse, and we can really get to some solutions because there's some big crises that we're facing right now. And my theory is that if we got enough people to kind of raise their consciousness, have more empathy, which is something that happens when you have a a psychedelic experience. Yeah, we live in a... We're going to get there. I feel like yelling out to the world sometimes where it's like, hey, if you don't know everything in life, it doesn't mean mean you're stupid. It's okay. Just keep an open mind. But that's the problem we have right now, because as we get data and content fed to our phone, it fits our narrative every single time. And back when we were growing up, if I saw a commercial, it would be the same television commercial as what you would see. Whereas now I get certain stories and ads sent to my phone that's based on what I believe in my algorithms over time. And everybody's just so opinionated about what they believe in now. And as a result, you know, you've got a world where we don't have much empathy. I 100% agree with that. Um, yeah. The only only way I've seen people get instantly more empathy is through either a near-death experience or a major psychedelic breakthrough. Yeah. And so I'm excited about that. Um, I'm you know, to that point, I'm working with a company right now called yeah, Psychosuitable. And we are, yeah, we're trying to make these psychedelic compounds safer and more effective. And so we at Psychosuitable, we've got two delivery system patents where we can deliver psychedelics. Uh, in one case, we've got a patent on delivering directly at the back of the neck at the base of the hairline. It goes directly into the nerve tissue, directly to the brain, and it avoids the whole systemic system which is where all the side effects happen when it goes into your systemic blood system. That's, you know, psych- the psychedelic experience, we can eliminate that. Um, lethargy, uh, nausea, dizziness, all these things. And so it really opens up psychedelics to, you know, younger people, elderly, people who are afraid. They get to get all the benefit of the psychedelic and the neurogenesis without necessarily having the psychedelic effect. And that's one of our patents. The other one is really exciting, developed at University of Michigan. And what it does is it's a uh, an, a delivery where you can put multiple psychedelics yep. together into the same formula. You can time release them over time so that rather than having to take it every couple hours, you take it once and every hour or two hours, whatever we program, another layer comes off and you're given more medicine. And as if that's not amazing enough, in the patent, you can change the size of the molecules and the shape. And they figured out that if you make triangular shapes in cancer drugs, it has a much faster uptake, much more targeted. So we're going to be able to take any psychedelic compound. We can be coopetition to all the psychedelic companies out there. And instead of wondering whether somebody's getting 
you know, whatever dose it is, because it's really hard to regulate right now. In a psychoceutical format, you'll take a tincture, you'll put on a topical, take a nasal, and you will get a small amount, but you'll get maximum bioavailability through this psychoceutical format. And I think this is what society and the medical industry needs to get comfortable with these as actual yeah. medicine. Because a doctor doesn't want to say, you know, hey, mushrooms are great. Take a couple of stems and a cap and tell me how it goes. They want to give you, you know, a pill or a formulation and know where what it's So you think do. drug delivery technology is where the real opportunity lies within the industry? I do, because a lot of the other companies that are out there trying to patent, you know, mushrooms, psilocybin for weight loss and things like that, it's going to be years and who knows if they're successful. These patents already work in the pharma yeah. space. We're just bringing them over to the psychedelic space and making things more safe, more effective. And so, yeah, I think this psychoceutical company uh, and delivery system patents are going to be the thing that allows proper dosing. And that's what the entire system has been waiting for. Wow. I watched Anderson Cooper's documentary at John Hopkins. that was on 60 minutes a while back. And one of the things that was brought up is about family history of people with schizophrenia related to psychedelics. And it's something that needs to be walked before you run because uh, it's something that, you know, they would somewhat caution um, based off of that. You know, we see a lot of promising things that this medicine is doing. Um, when I think about everything that you're describing and how it works and it sounds incredible, there's probably still that stigma out there where people are still very scared to try this because it is a new medicine. What's your answers to that? If they're going through that mindset? Yeah, I think, it, you know, again, it's education, but what occurs to me is that people of my parents' generation who are about 80 years old now, they were scared of cannabis for a long time. They were fed this story about how it was dangerous and scary and, you know, all that. And then now people in their 70s and 80s are trying cannabis and realizing, wow, you know, this is good for my health. I feel better. And so now when they're being, uh, when psychedelics are being put in front of them, they don't have the same resistance anymore. I'm seeing this, you know, with, uh, you know, 70 and 80 year old people who are taking psychedelics and they wouldn't have five years ago, but the path that cannabis cleared and the reality of the fact that, hey, you know, the government, the medical establishment just doesn't really know about this stuff because I'll tell you, you know, think about it. You know, doctors, they're supposed to know everything about medicine. They don't even know about nutrition. Most of the doctors that I see, they're not in good health. When you go to a hospital, the food is some of the most disgusting, yeah. unhealthy yeah. food in the world. And the food could cure most of the diseases. And so, you know, just because these medical programs and doctors and things don't know about it, it's really our job to educate people and bring them up to speed, especially the psychonauts who have tried these things before. It's our duty and our obligation. And like I said, I think people got to get a little bit more radical now and start demanding this from their government. Well, when I look at this world, like I was watching Joe Rogan's podcast earlier this week, uh, Ben Shapiro, and they're talking about the metaverse and where the world's going to look and like how people are going to interact with each other and create dopamines and how they're going to be totally content with living in like uh, a virtual world. And I know COVID has kind of opened up our eyes, good or bad. This is where we are today and where the world is going to be headed. And <clears throat> there was a doctor I had on last week and you know, on paper, it would appear that obviously mental health and the challenges that we're facing right now are not good because of the conditions. And I don't want this to be doom and gloom. Um, but I asked him, you're a psychologist. Where are we right now? And he's been involved for 40 plus years. And he said, I've never seen anything like this in my entire career of where we're at right now. Saying all that, you talk about the conversations you're having with political leaders. I firmly believe this is going to move fast a lot quicker than what people think because it is solutions and answers for what people need. Do you believe that too? Yeah, I really do. I think, you know, for me, the benchmark that's come up really recently is that uh, Ray Kurzweil, the futurist, said that in 2040, we're going to reach singularity where you're going to be, you know, connected to the internet in your brain. You'll be connected to the entire internet and you're going to have AI running all kinds of calculations and percentages. And he said that the average person right now 
uh, will be one who's connected will be one billion times more intelligent than you are today. And you think about that and it's like, wow, that's incredible. But at the same time, it's scary because, you know, if everybody's a billion times more intelligent, that means they could create a nuclear device, uh, you know, some kind of, you know, terrible thing that they could do. You know, a, a high school kid breaks up with his girlfriend and says, oh, I'll just blow up New York today and have that capability. And I'm saying before we get to 2040, we have to give people and get to a critical mass of people who've done psychedelics so they can expand their consciousness and we can have a large enough group with an expanded consciousness to say, hey, let's think about how some of these technologies are going to affect us. Let's think about, you know, integrating everybody around the world because we can't wait till 2039 and then go, oh, wait a minute. How are we going to handle this level of but don't power? You believe? And so it's a scary. Yeah, moment. but I believe that as you know. And all the baby boomers out there can get mad at me for what I say here, but I just feel like as we start to shift out, let's say one generation, and we start to see a younger generation and change, and that comes with time. Elon Musk has talked about it in the past. It's innovation. We need change. We need yes. a different, we're in living in a different era. 2040 is 18 years away. Think about that. Yeah. Yes. And it, you know, you think about that, how, what is there that could accelerate our, our brains, you know, because humans have evolved in a certain way. And now we're being bombarded with all this technology, all this information and media. I don't think our brains are no. even, you know, set up to handle this. So we need a quick evolution. How are we going to get a quick evolution of the brain? It's going to be psychedelics. It seems like it's going to be ketamine, because when you look at ketamine under a, a brain scan while somebody's uh, doing a treatment, you see that the brain is about 80 percent active. It's like the limitless drug. And that means that it's evolving the brain, growing new dendrites, creating new neural pathways. And that's what we need right now to accelerate that kind of, uh, you know, evolution in our species. Yeah. Well, um, obviously, being a filmmaker, you know, yourself included and the people that you're around, uh, we all understand people, especially in this industry, there's a high level of addiction, suicide, what's reality of life and what's not. And when you start to think about the metaverse, it's suddenly everyone across the entire world is living that sort of lifestyle. And it's like, how do we shut off the minds to think here we are consuming content eight to nine hours a day. And that's already system overload. And where we're going to be, like they say, the next 10 years, we're going to see more change than we did in the previous 10,000 years. And that to me is like, to your point, um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, as they say, one day at a time. Right. But at the same time, right. it's like it, I can understand what your initiative and in all this is and the importance of it all, right? Yeah. I mean, for me, this is a moment where, you know, 100 years from now, we can the, the society is going to look back and they're either going to say, hey, remember at the turn of the century, these are the people that turned away from nature they thought they were really clever. They went to technology and everything went bad. Rather, I'd like psychedelics, which looks like they're going to intermediate and disrupt us going off this cliff. In the 11th hour, we're going to go to the right and everything is going to be at a higher level. And I think when they look back 100 years from now, I would like us to be looked at as the generation that, you know, move back to, you know, higher consciousness, uh, trusting nature and things like that. So it's it, as scary as things are, I think it's really a very um, hopeful time because of psychedelic medicine. We got to have you on once a week. I'd love to talk to you more and more. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to talk metaverse. And, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, again, ketamine is, I've got a nonprofit called the Ketamine Fund where we've been giving uh, free treatments to veterans. We've given over 500 treatments. And these are- Good for you. On, know 22 medications wow. from the va they're now on no medications just doing their booster treatments and they're talking about having hope and feeling love for the first time in you know 10 years it's amazing so it's an exciting time. i know you're a very well connected person and uh, you have a lot of big network uh, people to obviously get this whole messaging going a lot forward so it's great and assuring to know that there are actually some people with some you know obviously powers to be to get the message out there and to give people hope as to like this isn't a five-year thing down the road and as much as i ask for that it's like you might see 
a lot of change in the next 12 to 24 months. So I applaud the initiative that you're doing. Keep up the great work. And especially, I really want to have you back in here because we could talk here all day. Yeah, no, there's so many uh, incredible studies that are coming out each week and different companies that are taking on different challenges. Uh, I'd love to be back soon. And thank you for doing what you're doing. You're kind of opening your audience up in a, in a really cool way to uh, alternative treatments and kind of cutting edge reality. I appreciate so, it. Kudos. I appreciate it. 